this, uh, this idea has been adopted in several community levels. So this is kind of the scaling issue for, uh, for smaller scale uh, electricity. Uh, my favorite example comes out of Quinell, British Columbia. They decided that uh, they really wanted to be green. And so several years ago, I think it's been five years now, they actually teamed up with some of their paper mills and now they have distributed heat and power throughout the entire town, uh, kind of piggybacking on this waste biomass. Uh, gasification is starting to enter into this. this. This is kind of showing that that farther term technology is coming down in cost and we have some smaller units that are coming on. So there's a, a little town in Austria that has a little heat and power plant and the, uh, the claims on this were that this turned this economically depressed area into a you know, beautiful green community. So I, I don't know if that's true. Um, India has pushed very hard. To, uh, to put a lot of smaller units out into communities. And they've, they've embraced uh, gasification in a really interesting way. They've got this thermal gasifier project and, and also talk about their biogas projects. But what they've done and what, what countries like uh, China has also, has also done is they've gone out and tried to address small scale energy problems in rural districts. And they've really done a great job of having a very uh, steady incentive from the government to do this. Uh, in the US, it's a little more fractured. Uh, so I think the biggest criticism that I read about, uh, about biomass electricity has to do with emissions. There's a perception that biomass has uh, high emissions. And, and that doesn't seem to be supported from any of the material that I was able to find. Um, so these are the raw emissions coming from coal and biomass. This is before you put any control unit on the emissions. And what you can see is that biomass uh, is very, very low. Of course, when you add the mandated control units that these industries have to have, they are extremely low. So biomass typically, unless it's a, a very specific types of organic municipal solid waste, does not have a lot of sulfur in it. The one issue you may have with biomass combustion is ash. So things that are uh, salts like potassium, it, part of the the plant's biomass can kind of foul the, the, the uh, boilers and the uh, gas fires. Uh, the one issue that I, I did find is that particular matter, particulate matter concentration can be high. But again, this is just if, if companies are not doing their due diligence and following regulations, they're going to have problems. And this would be true of any type of industry. And so, in fact, we've seen enforcement of this policy. There were two plants that were fined in California earlier this year for this violation. Particulate matter. And what are, what are the units? Oh, sorry, they got cut off. I, Is that pounds per? I honestly don't remember. I would have to, I'd have to, uh, to send that to you. Yeah, I, I think part of the graph got cut off, including the reference, which I, would, I can get to you. Um, the other issue that we find is in, um, is in permitting of facilities. And uh, I really wanted to talk a little bit about this, this company up on the top. So here are two just kind of typical stories for biomass plants. It takes about a, a two-year process to get permits through, regardless of whether you're using resi residues or uh, primary biomass. It can be quite expensive, although this is, you know, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be a huge percentage of the total cost of the facility. Uh, but this story up here, Taylor Biomass, was really interesting. And Jim Taylor started his wood recycling business uh, back in the 80s. So he was kind of ahead of his time, an entrepreneur who uh, he takes in construction waste and recycles it. And what he found doing this process and developing his business over many years was that he could only recycle about 60% of his waste. So he had this huge amount of biomass that he didn't know what to do with. And he really wanted to get all the value out of it. He's very committed to environmental issues and green uh, types of processes. So he decided to put in a gasifier unit. He, he did the literature, again, a little ahead of his time, and, and saw gasification was much more efficient. Um, and that decision caused him to have no end of headache in trying to get his permit. It cost him, him millions of dollars and extra years trying to get a more advanced and more efficient process through the permitting process. Um, the interesting part is that recently, because he was able to do this and kind of fight the fight and, and get through, Ab and Goa, who's another cellulosic ethanol company, has now contracted him to put in their gas fire unit to power their cellulosic plant in Kansas. So I thought that was a 
an interesting little story. The cost for these units is actually uh, not prohibitive. Um, it, it, direct combustion is the cheapest renewable electricity generation uh, technology. It's cheaper than wind. Uh, gasifiers have, have a, a long way to go, though, in meeting the cost. So it's actually more expensive than coal, uh, although less expensive than some other renewable technologies. This is nuclear, solar, geothermal. Um, but when you look through these economics, you may run across some facilities that are sitting idle. And this was the case when I looked at the renewable portfolio, uh, PUCs that met the renewable portfolio standard in California. Uh, what I found was that we had a lot of operating plants. Uh, we also had a lot of idle plants. And oddly enough, when you have idle facilities, you wouldn't expect there to be new projects being proposed at the same time. Right? So this shows that there's a disconnect in the funding and permitting of these facilities. And if you dig a little deeper, it turns out that most of these plants uh, came in at a time when natural gas prices were very low. Uh, they entered into the long-term biomass contracts, so this kind of goes to this biomass supply question that was asked earlier. Uh, and when the price of natural gas dropped again, they couldn't compete, even with the renewable portfolio standard. Um, and so I think there's some interesting lessons about that. With the renewable portfolio standard, all of the technologies have to compete with each other, which is really a good thing. But it's also a bad thing, because they're renewable technologies competing with other renewable technologies. They're not competing with fossil technologies. You know what I mean? So when the economics go bad, we see a shift in the portfolio that, that may or may not benefit us uh, environmentally. Uh, the other lesson in this, this uh, exercise was to look at uh, the fact that we also have a huge number of dairy digester products that are, projects that are sitting idle, although we have a bunch of new stuff coming online. And this prompted a little more digging on, on permitting. Um, and so I'll talk a little, a little bit now about biogas. What this turned out to be, though, was that the state had incentivized dairy farmers to install anaerobic digestion units on their manure ponds. And a lot of farmers did that. They started harvesting biogas and combusting it for electricity. And then Cal EPA changed the, the NOx emission standards. Okay, so those farmers then were no longer able to run their combustion units. Uh, the state did not come in and help them meet the new NOx standards, which would have been fairly simple. You just had to help them install, at a little extra cost, another control unit, or help them upgrade their combustion units. And so what, what the end result is is that 10 years after this program to to kind of rein in the emissions, and this is pure methane emissions from dairy, uh, we have 1% of dairy digesters functioning in California at the present time. OK, so biogas, uh, as you may know, is the production of methane through biological degradation of biomass. Uh, it's a really interesting technology because it's, it's completely scalable. So here's kind of a small scale version. This is at a co-op in India. This is something that has been implemented in Tibet in very remote areas, can be done in uh, very, very small village scale type facilities. And then I'll show you some larger scale facilities that are online in Germany and Japan, or, uh, China a little bit later. The nice thing about this technology is it's renewable heat and electricity, but it also solves a waste treatment problem. So it's primarily getting rid of refuse that we, we don't want to. It's corralling uh, emissions that we really don't want and it's reducing uh, wastewater footprints. Um, this technology has also been around for a long time, and it also faces a lot of, of hurdles. Uh, regulatory uh, standards are probably the biggest problem. Uh, you can combust the biogas directly, although it's a mixture of gases. It's only about 40% methane. Um, thanks. Uh, or you can upgrade that gas and, and feed it into the natural gas grid. The emissions are fairly low. It's 40 to 70% emission reduction if you create electricity um, using this process, and it can offset methane. So this takes care of some of our high industrial heat and load balancing problems. 